Roger Hao from Yale University to give a talk. And uh, Roger received his PhD from Berkeley in 1969, and he joined the Yale University in 1974 and stayed there since then. And he's now the, uh, Callum, uh, the um, um, William Kellum Professor of Mathematics at Yale University. He's also the uh, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Science and a member of the US National Academy of Science. So today he will talk about symmetry of symmetries, ramification of invariant theory in mathematics and physics. Let's work. Well, thank you very much. Um, I very much enjoyed uh, the chance to uh, visit the IAS from time to time, and, and um, I'm happy to give you this talk today. I have to say that, in some sense, this choice of topic was unwise. Um, this is a subject that I've been living with for quite a long time, and I think I thought it would be nice to give kind of a, a retrospective survey of part of it and sort of update, uh, give an update on the latest developments. Um, but I found that, you know, I, I fell victim to the usual syndrome. When you think about something over time, you get very used to it and it seems very simple. But then when you try to write it down and explain it to people, it may not be so simple. So uh, I apologize. I'm afraid there's rather a lot of ground to cover here today. And I tried to start fairly uh, elementary and um, so I apologize if uh, there's just maybe too much and I've skipped over some points, but let's see how it goes. So anyway, the general idea of invariance is, um, is, a, is a way of studying symmetry. So you have a group acting on a space uh, and, um, and then you look at functions on the space and you let group at move around functions by the way it moves around the points underneath except you have to put in a G inverse to make this a group action on functions. So, uh, so from, from the action on the space, you get an action on functions. And then um, you can see from this definition, since it's just moving around points, that this, uh, this operation on functions will preserve the algebra operations on functions. You, addition and multiplication will be preserved. Um, <clears throat> So, um, so we, a function is called invariant if it's unchanged. And that just means that if it takes a given value at a certain point x, it takes the same value at any g transform of x. So it, it, it takes the same value on all the points that can be transformed into each other by, by g. So it's telling you something about the way g moves points around. It's kind of restricting. Uh, how, how G can move points around. And because of the algebra preserving properties of this, of this definition, um, the, the collection of invariant functions will be an algebra. Will be, if you take a sum of two of them, it will be uh, another invariant function. If you multiply two of them, it will be invariant function. Of course, constants are certainly invariant, so constant multiples of invariant functions are invariant functions. So, uh, so the invariant functions form what's called an algebra. And the basic problem of, of invariant theory is to describe that algebra. And uh, OK, so let me give you some early examples or some basic examples where invariant theory uh, comes into uh, or sort of normal mathematics. Uh, one is the uh, issue of like in traditional a, th a thing in R2 of, of, uh, of putting uh, conic sections in standard form. So um, if you have a homogeneous quadratic polynomial, it's, level, it's one level set defines a conic section. And uh, if we rotate it by one of these rotation matrices, we can turn this function into standard form. So it looks like a, a normal ellipse or hyperbola depending on whether that's a plus or a minus. Um, but uh, you can show in, in this process, if you study what happens to this quantity here, AC minus B squared, you find that it doesn't change when you rotate the function. So that, um, that means that 
uh, if we compute uh, AC minus B squared for this quantity, it's just plus or minus 1 over AB squared. And so those two things are equal. So we can show that means that uh, the, the, this curve will be a hyperbola if, um, oh sorry, that should be a minus sign. If AC minus B squared is less than 0, the, the, the curve will be a hyperbola. And it will, if, it, if it's bigger than 0, it will be an ellipse, at least if it's not empty, which means you should also require A bigger than 0. And then if the curve is an ellipse, then it encloses uh, a region, and the region of the enclosed in the ellipse is pi AB, which we can express in terms of the invariant AC minus B squared. So the moral from this, and this is actually one of the original examples that got people interested in invariant theory, is that invariants carry interesting geometric information. So you, you, we don't have to put it, uh, something in standard form. We can just find out key properties by, by looking at the invariants. And another example that's uh, very important in, in linear algebra is uh, the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of a matrix. So, uh, so the general linear group acts on matrices by conjugation. Uh, and the, the, character, the characteristic polynomial uh, is invariant under conjugation. So uh, that means all the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial are invariant under conjugation. Uh, and uh, so when you study linear algebra, you learn that the characteristic polynomial of T actually determines the eigenvalues of T, which are one of the main things you want to know about the matrix. Uh, so the, the in, these invariants are, are telling you important information about T. And also, um, uh, it's also, on the invariant theory side, it's, it's known that the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial in fact generate the whole algebra of polynomial functions that are invariant under GLN acting on the matrices by conjugation. So again, here's a situation where um, invariant theory gives you important information and, um, and also you have a nice, uh, nice control over the invariant theory. You know exactly uh, where the invariants come from. Or you know a generator for the algebra of invariants and in fact, in this case, it's a polynomial ring. Um, however, um, in general, things are much more complicated. And uh, so the 19th century saw a huge amount of calculation and invariant theory. And uh, one of the main things that the people who did that learned was that the examples get hard fast. Uh, so uh, invariant theory had a big efflorescence in the 19th century, and then people kind of got exhausted and uh, they didn't study it as much. But in the, in the 1930s, Hermann Weil gave lectures at the Institute for Advanced Study, and he made a book out of it in which he described what he called the fundamental theorems of invariance for the classical actions. So I'd like to tell you what the classical actions are. So first I should say what the classical groups are. So the first one is the general linear group. This is the group of all, all invertible n by n matrices. Uh, and uh, then uh, it acts on the on the row on column vectors in the usual way, just by matrix multiplication. And we can also uh, act on, so the column vectors I want to call C n, and then the space C n star of row vectors, uh, again n tuples, but a horizontal rather than vertical. Uh, it acts by multiplication on the left. But you should, again, you should multiply by G inverse in order to make it a group action. And of course, there's a natural pairing between V and V star given by row by column multiplication. And if you check it out, you'll see that G actually, the general linear group, uh, preserves this pairing. So this is an invariant for the action of GLV on the product of V and V star. Um, so that's the first classical group, the general linear group. And then the second one is the orthogonal group. And um, so you can choose many different symmetric matrices with which to define an inner product. But anyway, the standard one is the usual Euclidean inner product. 
Uh, and um, <clears throat> so usually we think of this in terms of real numbers, but everything I'm doing here basically is over the complex numbers, so we can use the same formula. And then the orthogonal group is just all linear transformations that when you apply them to vectors, you don't change the value of the form. So again, this is actually, the, the group here is actually defined by an invariance condition, and the, the inner product then, uh, again, it was a function of two variables, but it's an invariant for, for the action of the orthogonal group. And uh, so an explicit set of equations for the orthogonal group is um, this one. So G times G transpose equals the identity. So this is another standard thing in linear algebra. And then uh, slightly less studied in linear algebra, but just important, just as important later on for physics, is the symplectic group in which you use a bilinear pairing in which, which is skew symmetric rather than symmetric. So it's represented by this matrix, which is, uh, uh, whose transpose is equal to its negative. And again, then the symplectic group, SP2N, is the group of things that preserve this pairing. Okay, so those are the classical groups. And then uh, they, each have, uh, they each have a standard action, the, way, the action in, by which they're defined, their action on, on, on CN or C2N uh, by, by matrices as described above. And so we call this the standard action. And then if we take some copies of this standard action, so if we think of one copy of CN as, as column matrices, we could think of this as several columns in a row, in other words, making uh, a matrix. Uh, and if we have M copies, this would be N by M matrices. And so then the, the group can just act on the N by M matrices by multiplication on the left, as it usually does. And then we can also let it act on the dual space, uh, as described above for the general linear group, we could do this also for the orthogonal group and the symplectic group, but there's no, di for those groups, because they preserve these bilinear forms, there's no difference between the group and the dual, so it's not necessary to consider them. So then, so a classical action, we mean we take a certain number of copies of the standard module and a certain number of copies of its dual, and if we're talking, this is for GLN, and if we talk about uh, the orthogonal group or the symplectic group, we don't need to worry about copies of the dual. Uh, but it's in this uh, context, uh, so some things that will be useful later on is to note that if we take the direct sum of two classical actions, we're just taking more copies of the basic action, so that's again a classical action. Or if we take the dual of a classical action, this is again a classical action. Okay, so. These are the actions that Weil studied. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the standard actions are in some sense the, the dullest ones, but, but when, he, when he studied more copies, he found that there was something interesting to say. Okay, so the, the, the meat of my talk is actually in four parts, and I don't know if I'll be able to say much about all four parts, but we'll see. And these are the four parts. First, I'm going to describe Weil's fundamental theorems. And then I'm going to, so uh, the, a point about Weil's theorems is that they just, they're very beautiful, but they just sort of sit there. You don't know what to do with them. Um, and it turns out that if you, if you relate them to what's called the Weil algebra, which was another object um, uh, introduced by Weil uh, in connection with quantum mechanics, uh, you can do a lot with them. Um, and it leads to, it leads to um, a, a big, a, a big it really opens up and connects the, the fundamental theorems with a lot of other stuff, uh, in particular a, a theory of general spherical, generalized spherical harmonics. And then uh, if you, if you uh, add a, think of relations of different groups and how they relate to each other, uh, you, you can get an, a, a lot of reciprocity laws for the connect multiplicities of different uh, groups. And then finally, um, I hope that I'll have time. This is the, the, newest, uh, the newest work is con connected with the, what I call the kernel, kernel of the harmonic decomposition. So I hope I can at least explain to you what I mean by the harmonic decomposition. Okay, so let's, let's recall Weil's results. So, um, <clears throat> 
Okay. So Weil is studying these classical actions um, on, oh, one of, let's see, that should be a star there. Uh, um, this, so v, y is the, is, or v is the standard action of GLV, and then we take the sum of V and some copies of V and some copies of V dual. And uh, then, so if we write uh, a typical point in Y uh, as, as Z, um, as a bunch of uh, vectors and then a bunch of covectors, then we see if we, we can compare, we can pair any vector with any covector, we'll get a number. And because, because GLV preserves that pairing, uh, this will be an invariant function for the action of G on YPQ. Uh, so this, and it, you see that if you write it out, this is quadratic in the coordinates of X's and L's. So we get uh, this collection of quadratic invariants for GLN. And it's similarly, if we take the orthogonal group, and we take a bunch of just vectors, we don't need the covectors anymore, and then we can take the pairing of two of those vectors. And then this will be invariant for the orthogonal group. So again, this will be quadratic in the, in the coordinates of the vectors. And again, so we get a, then a bunch of quadratic invariants uh, for the orthogonal group. And we can do the analogous thing for the symplectic group, where we use the, the symplectic pairing. And again, since, uh, so the, we're taking pairings of different vectors from different coordinates. Um, here, uh, for the orthogonal group, if we let a equals b, we'll get a non-zero function. For the symplectic group, if we let a equals b, we'll get uh, something that's identically zero. But if we have a and b different, we'll get a non-zero function. Okay, so we can produce, for each one of these classical actions, you can produce a lot of quadratic functions which are invariant for them. And uh, so, uh, what Weil called the first fundamental theorem of invariance for the classical actions was that these quadratic invariants, in fact, generate the full algebra of invariant polynomials on, on, uh, on the vector space Y. Okay, so a very clean and simple result. Uh, okay. Um, so I've just been talking about invariance, but uh, what people have found over the years is that even if you're only interested in invariant functions, uh, you also have to study the functions which are not invariant. And this leads to the idea of a representation. So uh, a representation, uh, so if you take a function, uh, if G is acting on a space and you take a function and you move it around by the group, uh, you'll get a bunch of other functions, and if you take all the linear combinations of those functions, you'll get a vector space, and that vector space will be preserved by the group. And uh, then, and then e, the, group, the, vec, the, the group will define a bunch of linear transformations on that vector space. So um, <clears throat> this, is a, this is what a representation is. A uh, representation is just a group homomorphism from G into the general linear group on some vector space. Uh, and there's some basic um, notions about representation theory that I'll, I'll, I'll go through in a whiz. Um, if you're not familiar at all with representation theory, this will probably be too fast. But, and if you know it, it's too slow. But anyway, uh, th these are the f basic things you have to talk about to talk about representations. One is you have to know when two representations are equivalent. Uh, uh, when you want to consider them the same. You want to know when one representation can be thought of as being contained in another. You want to, there's an idea of irreducible representation. So representations, if you haven't met them before, can be thought of as kind of a non-abelian version of eigenvalue and eigenvector theory, spectral theory. And, uh, and so irreducible representation is like an eigenvector. Um, and then you want to know about direct sums of representations. This is like decomposing a general vector into a sum of eigenvectors. So what is equivalence? Equivalence means you've got two representations. If you have a, a linear isomorphism between the vector spaces that sort of takes the action on the first space to the action on the second space, then you call the things equivalent. Uh, so uh, if you have just have one operator, um, 
and uh, you're talking about eigenvalues, this would say the eigenvalues were the same. Um, and then a sub-representation, well, it's obvious. If you have a representation on some space, and you have a subspace that happens to be invariant under all the operators, then if you restrict the operators to that subspace, you'll get a representation on that subspace, and it's called a sub-representation. Um, and of course, uh, for any representation, the zero subspace and the whole space will be always G invariant, so they'll define sub-representations, and those are called the trivial sub-representations, -rep sub and all the other sub-representations, one where you take a space that's not the zero space, not the whole space, those are called proper sub-representations. Okay, and then irreducible is obviously defined in terms of that idea, so an irreducible representation is something you can't find anything simpler inside, so there are no proper sub-representations. And in some sense, the uh, uh, so you only are interested in the irreducible representations up to equivalence, and, uh, and you, these, in some sense, are the atoms of symmetry for G, and they're usually written as G hat. Uh, so a priori, it's just a set. Um, and so one of the basic problems of representation theory is for a given group to describe G hat. And so for, for an example, I meant to write this down, but I didn't. But so if you take the, the group SU2 that's important in quantum mechanics and the theory of um, angular momentum in quantum mechanics, and uh, then the, it turns out that there's one irreducible representation for each dimension. The one-dimensional representation is the trivial representation where nothing changes, and then in two dimensions is the standard uh, representation of SU2, and then for every dimension, every positive dimension, there is a unique irreducible representation for SU2. And then the sort of the general problem of representation theory is if you know the irreducible representations and you have some other representation, then break that representation up into uh, irreducible representations. So this is sort of like the non-abelian version of Fourier analysis or eigenvalue. Um, so, um, I want to mention a very important theorem about in representation theory is Burnside's theorem. Um, so what we found, I mean, so the general idea is you have a group and a representation, and you want to find the invariant subspaces. You want to find the sub-representations. Um, and of course, um, if a subspace is invariant under, under, two, under the operators in a group, it will be invariant under the product operators and also under the sum operators. So we might as well, instead of just taking the group operators, we might as well take all possible linear combinations of those group operators and then anything that's invariant, and that will be in algebra, that will be closed under multiplication and addition, and then anything, any subspace that's invariant under the group will be invariant under, under that algebra also. So we, we turn the problem of looking for sub-representations for a group into the analogous problem for finding uh, invariant subspaces for a sub-algebra. And then, so how do we attack that? Well, uh, one way to do it is to look for operators that commute with the, your given algebra. So you've got an algebra, you want to find invariant subspaces. So suppose you can find an operator that commutes with everything in A then it's easy to show that, for example, the eigenspaces of that commuting operator will be invariant for the algebra A. So if you can find invariant, uh, con commuting operators, then you have a good chance of finding invariant subspaces. So you might as well, so then you say, okay, so I've got this algebra, I want to find commuting al uh, operators. What are all the commuting operators all the operators that commute with it. Well, that turns out to be another algebra. It's called A prime, and it's called the commuton of A. So you want to look for the commuton of A. Well, that's another algebra, so then you could say, well, what's the commuton of the commuton, the double commuton? 
it's easy to see that the original algebra is contained in the double commutant. They might be equal, but they not, might not be. Uh, so then uh, you could ask then, what's the triple commutant? Well, it turns out that the process stops there. The triple commutant is always equal to the commutant. So if A is equal to A double prime, then uh, the pair of algebras A and A prime form a pair of mutual commutants. And Burnside's theorem is about this situation. So where you have <coughs> an algebra and its commutant, uh, and such that the algebra itself is its own uh, double commutant. And uh, Burnside makes an additional assumption that A is semi-simple in the sense that, uh, the, uh, that the whole space V is a sum of all the irreducible subspaces for A. Okay? So you make this semi-simple assumption. And then Bernstein's theorem is a very beautiful theorem. So it says uh, if A is semi-simple, then its commutant is semi-simple. And there is a canonical decomposition of the space V into subspaces such that each uj is invariant under both algebras, and the joint action of the two algebras on uj is irreducible. There's no subspace of a uj which is invariant under both algebras. Um, <clears throat> and then if you take any two a invariant subspaces of uj, they're equivalent as representations of a, and also the same is true for a prime. So these uj's sort of lump the, sub the irreducible sub-representations of A that are the same together, and likewise for A prime. Um, and then it turns out that if you, if you take an, uh, an A irreducible subspace of UJ and an A prime irreducible subspace of UJ, then matching those up gives you a bijection of representations from A to A prime. So, um, so you get this correspondence of representations. Um, and in fact, uh, it turns out that the, the space uj is actually uh, isomorphic to the tensor product of uh, v and v prime. Um, and so if you think of uh, the, the irreducible representations as these atoms of symmetries, then this correspondence here is actually a, a bijection between these two collections of uh, parts of the dual set of G. So suppose A and A prime did come from groups. They were both uh, happened to be algebras generated by groups. Then you would be getting a bijection between part of the dual set of G and part of the dual set of G prime. So this is kind of a symmetry of symmetries. So this is the basis for the title of the talk. So now you know why it's called that. Um, OK. Uh, so I want to tell you, so I've talked about representations. And um, I should say something about, so what are the representations of the classical groups? And it turns out there's a very beautiful theory that describes them. It's called the theorem of the highest weight. Uh, it's due to Elie Carton. And uh, so if you have a classical group, and here it's important to be over the complex numbers, then it contains a subgroup called B, which is a maximal connected solvable group. And B contains a subgroup U, which is its commutator subgroup and is also a maximal unipotent subgroup of G. Uh, I'll say what that means in a minute. And then A is a maximal diagonalizable subgroup of B. Um, and, um, uh, since A is diagonalizable, I just want to talk about what, what, the, what the representations of A are. They're all going to be one-dimensional, and they're defined by characters. So a character is a homomorphism from A into the multiplicative complex numbers. And if you have a representation of A and V is an eigenvector for A, then uh, the action of an element of A on V will give you a character of A. So, so um, the characters of A are sort of all the ways that A can act on a vector as an eigenvector. And the characters themselves 
uh, are closed under, under multiplication. They're functions on A, and they're closed under multiplication, so they form actually a group under multiplication, and this group is called A hat. So it's, it's, it's the group of irreducible representations of A. Um, okay, so, so for billion groups, uh, representation theory is simple, and it turns out that for these, these are classical groups, you can almost reduce uh, the story of representation theory to this abelian situation. So, um, let me, so I've, I've talked about these groups B and U and A. Let me give you an exa what, what they look about like for, um, for GLN. So B is, is the group of invertible upper triangular matrices. So all upper triangular matrices with non-zero determinant. That's the group B. The group U is the group of unipotent upper triangular matrices, and unipotent just means that all ones on the diagonal. So the uni refers to the ones. Uh, all the eigenvalues of these guys are one. Uh, and then A is the group of invertible diagonal matrices that look like this. And then A hat, uh, the characters of A, are just gotten by raising the entries to various powers. So, um, so a, a character of A can be determined by an n-tuple of integers, uh, get the, these exponents here. In particular, uh, oh, this should be A hat. A, um, A m hat is, uh, uh, okay, that's some bad misprints. But anyway, A n hat is uh, isomorphic to uh, the n copies of the integers. Okay, um, so then here's the theorem of the highest weight that tells you how to, um, says you can parameterize the representations of G in terms of weights of A. And okay, so let's this be a representation of G. What you do is you look at the space of all U invariant vectors. It turns out this is always non-zero. So there will always be U invariants in any space uh, uh, any representation of G. So the representation might be irreducible for G, but if you restrict it to U, it will not be irreducible, and there will always be, in fact, a U invariant vector. And then uh, because A normalizes U, the space of U invariant vectors can be broken up into A eigenspaces. Uh, and uh, if V is irreducible, then the dimension of the U invariant vectors is one, and then, therefore, that, the, a, a vector in that space will be an A eigenvector, and the A character of VU determines V up to equivalence. So that, uh, and this, this, uh, this, this U invariant is called the highest weight vector, and the character of A is called the highest weight. Uh, and it turns out that, so not all characters of A uh, can occur as highest weight vectors highest weights, uh, but it will always be a semigroup, and this is called the semigroup of dominant characters, so it's called A hat plus, and for GLN the condition is that the, the, inter, the entries in that n-tuple should be decreasing, that mj should be greater than or equal to mj plus one. Okay. Um, and I want to mention a very beautiful um, way of sort of realizing all the representations uh, together. Um, so if we, take, um, if we take a classical group uh, and we look at its maximal unipotent subgroup and the, the maximal torus, uh, the A and the U, um, and the look at the characters and the dominant characters. And then uh, if we look at the ring of functions on G modulo U, and here we should think of G modulo U as an algebraic variety. So these are some kind of rational functions, not arbitrary functions. Um, <clears throat> then this decomposes into, uh, so the theorem of the highest weight, and particularly the, the uniqueness of that U uh, invariant for an irreducible representation, uh, and combined with Frobenius reciprocity, says that this ring of regular functions on G mod U is a 
sum of one copy of each irreducible representation of G. Very beautiful decomposition. And moreover, uh, so on this homogeneous space, G is acting on the left, and A, since A normalizes U, A can act on the right. And that will commute with the left action of G, so we have actually an action of G cross A, and we can break this up into A eigenspaces also. And uh, it turns out these are the same decomposition. So uh, each irreducible representation is an A eigenspace. And uh, when we, again, when, if, since, since everything is acting by automorphisms, if we multiply two A eigenvectors together, we'll get another A eigenvector, and the A character will be the product of the two characters. So that this direct sum here actually um, makes RG of U into an A hat graded algebra, uh, an algebra graded by the characters of A. And the, and the homogeneous subspaces are exactly the irreducible representations of G. So there's this extremely lovely picture for putting all the irreducible representations together in a family. Okay, so that's uh, representation theory. Now I want to so that's, uh, so I, I told you Vial's results, and then I gave you some background in representation theory to, um, to prepare you for uh, sort of the second stage of using Vial's results uh, to get a, um, kind of a duality theory for representations. So what, what this involves is looking at something called the Vial algebra, um, which Vial did, but he didn't put it together with his work on invariant theory, okay? So um, the idea is we look at, um, so when we were talking about polynomials, we were, you know, we had, were taking the algebra generated by just the coordinate functions x, j. And we, but we can also regard the x, j as operators on the polynomials just by multiplying, right? We take a polynomial, we multiply it by x, j. So we get some operators on the space of polynomials. And another set of operators on the space of polynomials are the, are the partial derivatives. So we can differentiate in any, part, in any uh, coordinate direction, and we could also take directional derivatives. And um, these guys also uh, are a nice, a nice uh, set of operators, and they will generate an algebra of all translation and variant differential operators on CN, and of course, these act on polynomials. This is what we do with them. We, we differentiate polynomials. So together with the xj and the dk, uh, we, get out, we get operators on polynomials. And if we, if we iterate those things, if we um, do them over and over again and take products and sums, then we'll get a big algebra of operators on the polynomials. And this is called the algebra of polynomial coefficient differential operators. And it's also called the Vial algebra. So the Vial algebra is just all polynomial coefficient differential operators. Um, and uh, so I want to talk about the structure of that a little bit. So I want to let x be the span of the, the multiplication operators xj and y be the span of the partial derivatives and w be the span of uh, the sum of those two things. So this is the span of these two guys. So we think of these both as sort of, we're sort of being democratic and we're thinking of multiplications and partial differentiations as sort of being first order operators and not worrying about exactly what they do, but think of them as first order operators. And then they don't commute with each other, okay? The, the, of course, the multiplication operators commute with each other and the partial derivatives commute with each other. This is the equality of mixed partials from multivariable calculus. But if we, if, we compose, if we do a multiplication and then do a differentiation, it's different depending on the order, right? And uh, if, if they diff involve different variables, it doesn't make any difference. But if they're the same variable, then the product rule for differentiation tells us that uh, if, we, uh, if we differentiate and multiply, uh, if we multiply and differentiate, and subtract the thing in the other order, we'll just get the function back. Exactly. So that uh, if k is equal to j, then doing this 
these things in two different orders and subtracting just gives us the function back, so it's the identity operator. Uh, okay, so, um, and if there are any physicists in the off, uh, audience, you should recognize these as a sort of a deunitized version, of a sanitized version of the Heisenberg canonical commutation relations from quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay, and there's a little bit more of a, a geometric way of thinking about those. So uh, as I said, I wanted to let W be the span of the xj and the dk. Um, <coughs> and because, uh, um, because the, the commutators of these guys are actually multiples of the identity, they're scalar operators. So this means that if we take, uh, you know, if we take linear combinations, that commutator is a bilinear thing, uh, then if we take the, the commutator of any two elements in the span, well, just again, we'll get a multiple of the identity, and the multiple will be a skew-symmetric function of the two vectors. Okay. So it's a, in, in fact, it's a symplectic form. It's a non-degenerate skew-symmetric form. In fact, if we use the basis uh, defined by first taking the dk's for the first n and then the xk's for the next n, we'll exactly get the standard symplectic form as given on one of the earlier pages. Um, and it turns out that the, the canonical commutation relations in this form exactly capture the structure of W in, in the following sense, that the vial algebra of polynomial coefficient differential operators, it's the universal associative algebra generated by w, w subject to the CCR. So in other words, if you have anywhere, if you have a collection of operators uh, acting anywhere that satisfy the CCR, then the algebra, the associative algebra that they generate will be exactly equal to the vial algebra. Okay, now, um, so we know that, uh, so the vial algebra is a big, big algebra of operators on, on, uh, on the polynomials. Uh, we also have GLN acting on the polynomials. GLN is not part of the, the elements of GLN are not part of the vial algebra. Um, but the, if we look at the associated infinitesimal action of the Lie algebra on that, then that does belong to the vial algebra. And in fact, if you take, if you differ, if you take a n by n matrix and you differentiate the one parameter group that it generates, then, then the action of T, uh, the infinitesimal action is given by this. So you see these are linear product of one dk and one xj. These are li called linear coefficient vector fields. And these are studied a lot in, in, in uh, courses on differential equations. Um, Okay, but uh, although the general linear group does not belong to the vial algebra, it does, con it does normalize the vial algebra. If I conjugate an element of the vial algebra by uh, a linear transformation, uh, I'll get some, I'll again get a polynomial coefficient differential operator. So, um, so <coughs> the G GLN acts on the vial algebra by conjugation, and this will of course be an action by algebra automorphisms again. Okay, so um, uh, more precisely, add G actually preserves the spaces of X's and Y's, uh, the, uh, of the span of the XJ's and the span of the D by D XJ's. And um, it turns out that, uh, that X as a module for uh, GLN under conjugation is isomorphic to the dual of CN, and Y is isomorphic actually to CN. So that W, which is the sum of X and Y, is a direct sum of CN and its dual. Um, uh, okay, and so if uh, what recalling, I mean, the action of, of GLN. Uh, on, on the differential operators was by conjugation. 
so that if you have an invariant differential operator, right, maybe I should pull that back. Okay, so, um, so we have this action here. So if, if, if add g of L is equal to L, if L is invariant under add g, uh, if that's equal to L, then if I multiply this um, equation on the left by g, I'll get g star L is equal to L g star. It says that L commutes with g. So, um, so being invariant for the adjoint action is the same as commuting. Uh, so the invariants in this case are just all the operators, polynomial coefficient differential operators that commute with, uh, with G. Uh, so that means that if we have some subgroup of GLN, then the space of add G invariant differential operators will be exactly the algebra of all differential operators that commute with G. So we have this way in this situation of finding the commutant of uh, if we can do invariant theory in this situation, then we can find the commutant of uh, a group of, of a group acting on, on the polynomials. Okay, so let's. I want to talk a little bit more about the structure of the Weyl algebra, and um, so it, it's generated by by the space W. So that means that anything is a, is is a sum of sufficiently many products of, of elements of W. So let's let WK be the span of all the length K products. And it turns out that since, <coughs> since the commutator of two things in W is a scalar operator, this translates to the higher uh, spaces as this. When you take the commutator of something in WK and WL, it drops down by two degrees. So this means that if, we, if you look at the quotients, if you look at all the operators of length uh, k modulo the space of all operators of length k minus 1, uh, then and you form the sum of those things, turns out you can put an algebra structure on those, and that algebra will be commuted. commuted. This is called the associated graded algebra of W. And in fact, so it's a commutative algebra. It's generated by W, and in fact, it's naturally isomorphic to the polynomials on W. Uh, okay, um, and um, so suppose uh, we want to make the following observation. Uh, <clears throat> we've uh, noted that suppose we have a subgroup. Uh, uh, suppose we have a subgroup uh, of G acting by a classical action. Okay. Um, then uh, on, 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 on uh, sorry, a subgroup of, of, of GLN that acts on CN by a classical action. And since, since W is the uh, polynomial ring on uh, CN plus CN star, and uh, duals of classical actions and direct sums of classical actions are again classical, the action of G on the polynomials on, on, sorry, on W, or on the, on the graded version of W, will again be a classical action. Okay. Okay, and there's one more really nice piece of structure about the Weyl algebra, um, and it related to those commutator relations. So we know that, uh, that the, the W1, so what is this? This is the degree zero or degree one products. In other words, this is the scalars or W itself. Uh, we call, this is actually a Lie algebra and uh, the commutator of any two guys will actually land in the scalars. So this is what's called two-step no pot potent. And if you take another commutator, you'll get zero. So this is the Heisenberg Lie algebra. Um, but the CCR also implied that W2 is closed under co commutator, which means that it is also a Lie algebra, and also W2 bracket with W1 is going to be contained in W1. So that W2, commutator with W2, normalizes the Heisenberg Lie algebra. And we can refine that in a nice way. 
so if we look in, inside W2, we look at all the linear, the, the symmetrized products. So we take an element, two elements of W and we multiply them together in both possible ways and we add up. This is a symmetrized product or anti-commutator of W and W prime. So if we let S2 of W be the span of all of those, then uh, some simple calculations with the canonical commutation relation show that this is a complement to the Heisenberg group inside W2. So that W2 is the direct sum of this S2 plus the Heisenberg. And that S2, in fact, itself is a Lie algebra and that S2 normalizes not just Hn, but actually Wn inside Hn, so that the commutator of something in S2 of W with something in W is again in W, and it's not hard to show then that this, so this gives us a Lie algebra action of S2 on W, and it's not hard to show that this action identifies S2 with the Lie algebra of the symplectic group of W. Okay, so the symplectic group, at least infinitesimally, is already sitting inside the vial algebra. Okay. Um, and I should mention also that, <coughs> so we'll call this the metaplectic Lie algebra, and um, MP2N. And uh, we should note that S since W is the sum of X and Y, S2 of W will be the sum of, if we could take two, product, two elements of X or two elements of Y or the anti-commutator of a guy in X and a guy in Y, this gives, breaks up S2 of Y into three pieces, which I call 2, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 2. Uh, 2, 0 is exactly the second order polynomials, okay? It's spanned by the products of two coordinate functions. And M2, 2, 0 is a second order partial derivatives. It's spanned by the product of two partial derivatives. And MP11 1, 1 is spanned by the symmetrized products. And it's almost equal to the linear vector fields, but there's a slight correction term. And actually, if you're a physicist, uh, this correction term is related to what's called the zero point energy in, uh, in crystals. So all, all this stuff is, is intimately related with physics. Um, okay, so, um, so this is sort of what happens when you, when you combine uh, Weyl's theorem with, with, the, with the Weyl algebra. So we take a classical group and take a classical action. Um, and then, um, <coughs> then we can let it act on the vial algebra by the conjugation. And um, then, uh, so we get an action on the vial algebra, and this will factor to an algebra on the associated graded algebra, which we've seen is the polynomials on W. And so uh, from our remarks above, since gamma is a class classical action, uh, this, uh, this action here is also a classical action. So now we can apply vials at FFT to this situation, and it says all the invariants for this conjugation action will be generated by quadratic invariants. But the quadratic guys are just the metaplectic Lie algebra. And uh, so what we're looking at is all the quadratic guys that commute with G, that's going to be some Lie subalgebra of the, uh, of the metaplectic Lie algebra. And so um, it says that <coughs> the algebra of all, uh, of all polynomial coefficient differential operators commuting with G uh, is generated by this little commuting Lie subalgebra inside the metaplectic group. Um, now, the polynomial algebra is infinite dimensional and, um, and the polynomial coefficient differential operators are not all, are not all linear operators on, on, on the polynomial algebra. We've seen, for example, linear operators are not in there. Uh, but still, uh, <coughs> things look enough like the finite dimensional situation that you can uh, establish, uh, you can use the reasoning of Burnside's theorem and uh, this, this observation here establishes uh, 
that the polynomial ring canonically breaks up into a collection of irreducible action, irreducible representations for the joint action of G and this uh, commuting Lie algebra, which I've called G prime. Okay, so you get this canonical decomposition of, uh, of a full polynomial ring into these little spaces which are irreducible representations for the product action and this correspondence between the irreducible representations of G and the irreducible representations of the Lie algebra G prime is, is a bijection. So this is, uh, this is Burnside's theorem in the context of classical actions. Um, Okay, and because of, the, um, <coughs> because of this extra structure that uh, the metaplectic the algebra has of breaking up into these two components, G prime will also break up into these components. These guys here are the, the invariant polynomials. So these are the quadratic polynomials invariant by G. Uh, these are the second order differential operators invariant by G, and these are uh, the linear vector fields invariant by G. Um, and because so, um, these guys all lower the degree of polynomials, these guys all raise the degree of polynomials. And you can use that structure to conclude that, um, so if, if, you look at, if you look at the harmonics so these, these, the guys in here are a little bit like Laplace operators. Uh, they're call, you, sometimes they're called partial Laplacians. And anyway, they reduce degree so that um, eventually, if you start with any polynomial, if you apply these guys enough times, you're going to kill it. So they'll have, so they'll, uh, these guys will have a, a big kernel. So um, what we want to do is we want to look at the kernel for all. The, the things that are in the kernel of all these operators are killed by all these partial Laplacians and call those the harmonics. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we look at the invariants. These are the things generated by this guy. And then it, you can show that the whole polynomial ring is, if you take the harmonics and then you multiply them by invariants, you'll get everything. So we call that the harmonic decomposition. And, um, <coughs> So we've seen that the full space has this decomposition into these tensor products. It turns out that uh, if we look at the 1-1 one, one part, the centralizer of gamma inside GLN, then the, har then the harmonics will be invariant under this 1-1 one, one part, and the harmonics will break up in a similar way to the, the full algebra polynomials into representations of G times representations of this group G one one. And I'll just mention that G prime one one is always a product of general linear groups. Okay, so so the the duality that we've uh, described on the previous page has this refinement uh, that actually makes finite dimensional representations correspond. Representations of one of your classical groups with representations of GLN. Okay, and as an example, it, we have the theory of spherical harmonics, which has been uh, important in physics for a long time. Um, so uh, we take the, just the orthogonal group acting in the standard way on, on Cn, uh, and then uh, it will commute with the, uh, with the Euclidean norm. It will commute with the Laplace operator, and then if we take the commutator, oh, that should be commutator, not uh, anti-commutator. Uh, if we take the commutator of those two guys, we're going to get this guy. Some of you may realize this is the Euler degree operator. If you apply this to a polynomial, you'll just get the degree of the polynomial back times the polynomial. So the homogeneous subspaces, the polynomials are the eigenspaces for this operator. And then uh, you get an extra n because of the, uh, uh, because of the failure of these guys to commute. Um, okay, uh, 
And since, uh, again, since the polynomial Laplace I permits polynomials degree d to polynomials degree d minus 2, and which has a lower dimension, there's going to be some kernel of there. That's the harmonic polynomials. And then the theory of spherical harmonics says that any polynomial can be written uniquely as a sum of harmonic polynomials times powers of r squared. And this is exactly the specialization of, of that general theorem on the previous page to this case where you just take one copy of the action of the orthogonal group. Okay. And it turns out that um, in some sense, the theory, there's, 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 there's more symmetry going on here. I mean, I, uh, we, we discovered it in terms of a classical action and then some Lie algebra which commutes with it. But actually, um, the Lie algebra of the classical group is also a subalgebra of the metaplectic Lie algebra. And those, the G and the G prime, turn out to be uh, each other's centralizers inside, inside the metaplectic Lie algebra. So, um, and it turns out actually that that characterizes <coughs> the classical actions. If you have, anytime you have an action of a group G on a, on a vector space, you can you can map it into the automorphisms of the, meta, uh, of the polynomial coefficient differential operators, and you can consider it, it will give you a Lie subalgebra of the metaplectic Lie algebra, and then you can look at the centralizer of that, and then you can look at the double centralizer, and the original Lie algebra will be equal to the double centralizer exactly when that was a classical action. Uh, so, um, so that this, this, this situation is really special to these classical actions. In some sense, this explains, um, I mean, so this sort of explains what's special about the classical actions. So Weil is getting this, these wonderful theorems. Uh, this is sort of what, what's really special about them, that, that they are the central, they're their own double centralizers inside, uh, inside the Weil algebra. Okay, but anyway, so, um, so if we have a pair of mutually, each one is the centralized of the other, we call that a dual pair. And we can do that inside the Lie algebra or inside the group. And I'm just going to, just from now on, I'm going to, just to simplify things, I'm going to talk about dual pairs inside the symplectic group. So um, there's, there's another sense in which we have a symmetry of symmetries. We have these dual pairs. Each group can be considered some kind of uh, collection of symmetries, and then we have this matching between them. Uh, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about reciprocity. Um, so it's possible you can imagine the following situation: that we have um, we have a classical a, a classical group acting with a classical action, and we have some subgroup of it, and the restriction of the classical action to the subgroup is again classical. Okay, it's obviously a very special situation, but it does happen. And then, uh, then the, uh, the, the images of the groups under gamma will both belong to dual pairs inside the symplectic group. So we'll have G and G prime, and H and H prime. And so H is contained in G, which implies that G prime will be contained in H prime. So we can write this little diagram like this. Uh, and it kind of looks like uh, a seesaw, if you've ever been to a children's playground and saw one of those things go up and down. Uh, so this is called a seesaw pair of dual pairs. And this idea comes from Steve Kudla. And it turns out that in the context of, of these seesaw pairs, there's a very nice reciprocity theorem, uh, which I'll state in the kind of a crude form. So if we have... Um, <coughs> So we have a correspondence between representations of G and of G prime. And we have a similar correspondence between representations of H and H prime. Okay, then we can consider this uh, representation of G and we can restrict it to H. And we can say with what multiplicity does a given, uh, uh, sorry, we take a representation of G and we restrict it to H and we say, with what multiplicity does this representation of H occur in the representation of G? And we can do the same thing with the representation of H and restrict it to G prime, H prime, 
restricted to G prime. And it turns out uh, that the, these multiplicities are the same. Okay? The multiplicity of sigma twiddle E in sigma D is the same as the multiplicity of tau D in tau twiddle E. Uh, and there's a, very, there's a nicer version of this that involves multi-graded algebras, but I don't have time to talk about it today. Uh, in fact, I don't have time to talk about anything else, I guess. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more. Um, okay. Uh. And uh, I would like to, although this is obviously a very special situation, there are a lot of examples. In fact, if H is a symmetric subgroup, of G, the fixed points of an involution, then uh, the classical restriction of a classical action is classical. And uh, it there, this is a so these are the these are the classical symmetric pairs. Uh, the orthogonal group in GLN or the symplectic group in GLN, or uh, any group inside its diagonal as a diagonal subgroup of, of a product of two of them, or um, OP times OQ inside of OP plus Q as block diagonal things, and similarly here. And you can arrange these guys in a nice circle that's related to the Bott periodicity theorem. See, so what I've done here, so ON is the subgroup here, and then it's the big group here, and then OP times PQ is the subgroup here, and then it's the big group down here, and you can go around this circle like this, and going around this circle amounts to real bot periodicity. And there's a complex one here just involving two pairs that involve only GLN. This is uh, related to com a complex bot periodicity. This is for complex K-theory and for real K-theory, for those of you who uh, like topology. Okay, and then it turns out that these correspondences between uh, uh, these, um, uh, these seesaw pairs give you correspondences that go across this circle. So kind of form a, a, a reflection of the circle along the vertical axis. And here again, these two correspond. So um, uh, anyway, this is just a nice way of organizing all those reciprocity laws. OK. OK, so, um, so the last thing I'd like to say a little bit about is the fine structure of the harmonic decomposition. So um, an, a, an important part of the theory of spherical harmonics is that that decomposition into harmonics times powers of R is unique. OK, there's only one way to do it. And what that means, in that, uh, what that translates in terms of this mapping, so we, we multiplied harmonics times invariance and got polynomials. Uh, and we can think of that as a mapping from the tensor product of the harmonics times the invariance. And uh, if that decompos the uniqueness of that decomposition is equivalent to this mapping being uh, a bijection, being, uh, ha having no kernel. We know that it's onto, but also then it has no kernel if that decomposition is unique. Uh, so it turns out that uh, if uh, the, the, the G prime is relatively small, so in the case of the spherical harmonics, the G prime was just an SL2, three-dimensional, then, um, then this harmonic decomposition is unique. But when G prime gets larger, when you take more and more copies of the standard module, then at some point the uniqueness breaks down. And so you'd like to say, well, what is the kernel then? How, 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 how badly does it fail? Or can we describe how it fails? And it's turned out this, this has been kind of a difficult problem. And um, it seems to require understanding of the structure of these factors, OK? Uh, so these, neither of the, these are, uh, uh, well, this is, this is not even a ring in general, but it's certainly not a polynomial ring. This, this can be a polynomial ring, but if, if, the, if the G prime is large enough, this also is not a polynomial ring. So you have to try to understand uh, the structure of these rings. Um, and uh, well, there, we can think of this guy as a ring by pulling back from the quotient by the ideal generated by the positive degree invariance. So we can think of this as an algebra. So we'd like to describe something about the structure of these two algebras. And uh, recently, 
uh, we've realized that there is uh, something very nice you can say about the structure, and I'm, uh, I'm going to state it here, but I think uh, so um, these two rings uh, almost have flat deformation to a kind of a ring called a Hibby ring. I'll say what that is. And in particular, each of these guys have a, has a standard monomial theory, and so this tensor product has a standard monomial theory. And so we, we're hoping that this structure will let us describe the kernel. So maybe I can just say a couple words about uh, what the words involved in that word. So Hibby cones are a special nice kind of a cone. Um, what you do, you take a partially ordered set. Uh, you, you can have the vector space of all real valued functions on it, non-negative real valued functions on it, order preserving real valued functions on it, non-negative order preserving real valued functions on it. Then you can take the integer valued functions and do all that again. So what you do is you take the non-negative integer valued order preserving functions on that partially ordered set, and this will be uh, a semigroup. You, if you add two of those, again, it will preserve the order. And then the Hibby ring is the semigroup ring of that semigroup, of that cone. Okay, and uh, so this, um, this has been very quick, and these are probably not familiar to most people, but the point is that uh, <coughs> you can t find lots and lots of lattice cones. Uh, these are the really nice lattice cones. Uh, and in particular, uh, this, uh, this, these lattice cones allow an explicit decomposition uh, into, into semigroup ring, or into f uh, or or free semigroup rings. And, um, and, and we ha can e explicitly describe the uh, generators and relations. So, um, so if we have, uh, we have the Hibby cone, uh, if we t so here we want we to look at the Hibby cone for a given post set. Uh, the Hibby cone, if we take the totally ordered set, so we put a total order on some set, then uh, it turns out that that cone looks just like the positive orthon. It has a, it has a free basis. And uh, so if you look at all the total orderings compatible with a given partial order, then uh, the Hibby cone breaks up into a union of the cone of the Hibby cones associated to those partial orders. So you're breaking up this general cone into a bunch of, um, of very nice uh, simplicial cones. Uh, and the corresponding thing is if you look at the corresponding Hibby ring, then it is a direct, is an almost direct sum of polynomial subrings, and you can explicitly describe the generators and relations, and you can explicitly describe all these polynomial subrings, and so you can explicitly describe a basis for, uh, for these Hibby rings, and th those descriptions is the standard monomial theory. What you do is you take each one of those polynomial subrings, and uh, it's easy, so you know what a basis for a polynomial ring, this is why we like polynomial rings so much, right? Just the monomials are a basis for the polynomial ring. So you have this collection of polynomial subrings inside here, and <coughs> for any two of them, if, 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 the, if they intersect, they intersect because they have some elements in common, and the, 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 um, the monomials in the two bases will agree. So you'll get an irredundant expression for any element in the Hibby cone or in the Hibby ring as, as a monomial in these, uh, as, as an element of one of these polynomial subrings. And that's called standard monomial theory. And uh, so since, um, since those two factors of the, uh, of the harmonic decomposition both uh, have standard monomial theory, you can show that uh, um, it's easy to show that um, 
it's easy to show that the, the tensor product also will have a standard monomial theory. So um, we're optimistic that uh, we'll be able to describe the kernel in terms of the standard monomial theory. And I should say again, standard monomial theory has, has a long history going back to Hodge's work in the 1940s and uh, was a big theme during the, all during the second half of the 20th century and now we're finding that it's very useful in this context. So thank you very much. Just a short preface, because I grew up in Little Rock with Jerry Bona and Louis Scott. Okay. And I ended up being a molecular biologist here, a biochemist, but I'm actually a wannabe theoretical physicist from when I was a kid. So I heard about this stuff forever, but didn't really ever do theoretical mathematics myself. And I just got a chance to catch up with Jerry in Taipei in December. So I've kind of heard that a lot of stuff got taken care of during the second half of the 20th century in terms of theoretical development. So the question is, since I'm naive and I missed the introduction where you might have said this, uh, what, what is your understanding of why this beautiful theoretical stuff turns out to be so useful for physics in the real universe? I mean, it would have been okay with me if it had just been beautiful theory, but it's turned out to be a lot more useful than I expected. Well, I really wish I could answer that question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I've thought a lot about that myself. And, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think nobody can quite answer that. I mean, maybe the best answer is, is Wigner's phrase about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's pretty wonderful. Well then, um, you can't. I mean, you can't get a decomposition into irreducibles. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <coughs> you, have the blocks. you can get blocks. Yeah, uh, but it's 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 much more complicated. I, I don't actually know what the what the full theory is. It. Um, the, I mean, you can have a uh, you can have a representation that breaks up into a lot of pieces. Uh, but uh, the commuting algebra is really, really small and doesn't give you very good resolution of those pieces. Uh, so it fails pretty badly. So it's nice that we could apply Burnside theory in this situation. Yeah, the, um, yeah this, is, this is the world of, of, of semi-simple representation theory. Now representation theory has to worry about non-semi-simple situations and it's working a lot harder to do that.